Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Eye in the Sky by Philip K. Dick. So this is a sci-fi novel, uh, it's got some like religious tie-ins to it as well. Weirdly, I've read quite a few books like that recently as well, I don't know why. Uh, this is uh, an old little, what is it, panther science fiction? Don't actually know. Arrow science fiction, okay. I'm going to read you the blurb as always, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. As Jack Hamilton ascended higher into the stratosphere, he could see the great ball of Earth spread beneath him, and it was standing still. Around it, in an orbit, swung a tiny mass of glowing matter, the Sun. It was the ancient geocentric universe come true, a universe with Earth at dead centre and all other celestial bodies subservient to it. As he rose still higher, he found that he was peering into a gigantic lake, a lake roomy enough to hold all Earth without a ripple. And then, with a shocked gasp, Jack realised that it wasn't a lake at all. He was peering into a colossal eye, an eye in the sky. He was trapped in someone else's personal world, as someone who seemed not very sane. A world of fundamental religion, ruled over by a crude version of an Old Testament God, where the sinners were miserable and the righteous intolerant and intolerable. So let's check out some tabby tab tabs. So there's a lot of stuff about communism in this, so I'm gonna... Uh, and I, I think this is important as well, because it shows how, like, nothing's ever black and white, you know? <laughs> okay, what, Hamilton demanded, does pro-left mean? It means sympathetic to groups or persons sympathetic with communism. Laboriously, McFive continued. On May the 8th, 1953, Mrs. Hamilton wrote a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle protesting the barring of Charlie Chaplin from the United States, a notorious fellow traveller. She signed the Save the Rosenbergs appeal, convicted traitors. In 1954, she spoke to the Almeida League of Women Voters in favour of admitting Red China to the UN, a communist country. In 1955, she joined the Oakland branch of the International Coexistence or Death Organisation, with branches in Iron Curtain countries. And in 1956, she contributed money to the Society for the Advancement of coloured people. He translated the figure. $48.55. There was silence. That's it? Hamilton demanded. That's the relevant material, yes. Does it also mention, Hamilton said, trying to keep his voice steady, that Marcia subscribed to the Chicago Tribune, that she campaigned for Adlai Stevenson in 1952, that in 1953 she contributed money to the Humane Society for the advancement of dogs and cats? I don't see what relevance these have, Edward said impatiently. They complete the picture. Sure, Marsha subscribed to him. In fact, she also subscribed to the New Yorker. She left the Progressive Party when Wallace did. She joined the Young Democrats. Does it mention that? Sure, she was curious about communism. Does that make her a communist? All you're saying is that Marsha reads left-wing journals and listens to left-wing speakers. It doesn't prove she endorses communism or is under party discipline or advocates the overthrow of the government or... We're not saying your wife is a communist, McFive said. We're saying she's a security risk. The possibility that Marsha is a communist exists. And then they basically say that his responsibility is to prove that she isn't a communist. Okay, so uh, here we get a cat, which I like. Uh, we have this, look. There's Jack's cat, Marsha said, fishing in her purse for her key. He wants to be fed. So the cat, she instructed, go on inside, ninny num cat. You don't get fed out here. What a quaint name, Miss Reese observed, with a touch of aversion. Why'd you call him that? Because he's stupid, Hamilton answered briefly. Jack has names like that for all his cats, Marsha explained. The last one was called Parnassus Nump. Uh, and then one of the characters doesn't like cats. We get, cats have no souls, Hamilton said morbidly, watching his tomcat avidly feed. The most majestic cat in the universe would balance a carrot on his head for a piece of pork liver. And then Hamilton says later on, uh, it's attitudes like hers that lead to extermination camps. She's rigid, a compulsive personality type. Anti-cat is one jump away from anti-Semitism. Bit of a strong claim. And so uh, we get some more communism jabs here. Um, this joke is a red, McFive volunteered, and an atheist. Horrified, the girl drew back. No kidding! Sure, Hamilton told her. At this point, it was all the same to him. I'm Leon Trotsky's maiden aunt. I gave birth to Joe Stalin. And I just enjoyed this little bit of dialogue here. You know what you can buy at the supermarket? Laws inquired acidly. I'll tell you. Canned burnt offerings. You know what you can buy at the hardware store? Hamilton answered. Scales to weigh your soul on. That's silly, the blonde said petulantly. A soul doesn't have any weight. Then, Hamilton reflected, you could put one through the US mail for nothing. How many sales? How many souls, Laws conjectured ironically, can be fitted into one stamped envelope? New religious questions, split mankind in half, warring factions, blood running in the gutters. We get Silky studied him, you're a funny boy. I'm 32 years old, I'm not a boy, and I'm married. I turned 32 in a couple months. But that's what the, the term the book uses, uh, and they're in a white man's room. And then he call, somebody gets called uh, an N-bomb lover. And someone's horrified, um, which I enjoy this being vegan, although they are talking about cottage cheese. 
The correct food is very important. Right now I'm living on molasses and cottage cheese. Give me sirloin steak, Hamilton said feelingly. Shocked, Silky gazed at him with horror. Steak, animal flesh. You bet, and plenty of it. Smothered in onions with baked potato, green peas and hot black coffee. Horror turned to revulsion. Oh, Jack, what's wrong? You're a savage. Uh, we get a mention of Big Sur, which is a mountain which I mostly know of because of Jack Kerouac. And then we get this conversation. Mrs. Pritchett, Hamilton said casually, has it ever occurred to you that the Irish have made no contribution to culture? There are no Irish painters, no Irish musicians. Jesus God, McFive said stricken. No musicians, Mrs. Pritchett asked in surprise. Dear, dear, is that so? No, I hadn't realised that. The Irish are a barbaric race, Hamilton continued with sadistic pleasure. All they do is... George Bernard Shaw, McFive howled fearfully. The greatest playwright in the world. William Butler Yeats, the greatest poet. James Joyce, the... He broke off quickly. Also a poet. Author of Ulysses, Hamilton added. Banned for years because of its lewd and vulgar passages. It's great art. Yes, it is great art. The Irish are great. We have the Irish Readathon here on Booktube. If you don't know any decent Irish authors, check out the Irish Readathon. You'll be, you'll be loving it. You'll be having loads of crack. And now uh, basically we, as you can tell from the blurb, we end up in this like place where this, this woman has like a godlike power over everything. So we get, abolish cows, Miss Reese cried, but it was unnecessary. Edith Pritchett had already felt displeasure. The cow was gone. And so Hamilton noted was his belt and his wife's shoes and Miss Reese's purse, all were made from hide. And on the picnic cloth, the yogurt and cream cheese had left too. This bit I enjoyed as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is like this couple talking. Go turn on the light and the heater. Get it all nice, all lit up and inviting. So it'll be that way when I come down. Bending forward, he kissed her on the mouth. I'll have it radiating eroticism. Marsha wrinkled her nose at him. You scientists. And then towards the end, Hamilton says, From now on, I'm going to be perfectly honest with everybody. Say exactly what I think. Do exactly what I feel like. Life's too short for anything else. Hard agree. So all in all, Eye in the Sky by Philip K. Dick, I mean, it was interesting, I liked the idea of like just this one person having omniscient, uh, omnipotence rather, over their surroundings and whatnot, and it does a good job of taking a lot of like biblical and religious stuff through to its logical conclusion, but uh, again, just contextually for me, I'd read like three books like this recently, so... I don't know, it struggled to find anything new and to really grip me. But I did still enjoy it a reasonable amount. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 and would recommend if you're looking to like read more, read more dick. So there we have it. That's what I made of Eye in the Sky by Philip K. Dick. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.